What? There we go. All right, I'm recording now. So let me rephrase what I just said. All right. The dermis is made up of connective tissue proper. If you guys remember, connective tissue proper is made up of both loose and dense connective tissue. All right. So that means that there's three subcomponents of each. So for connective tissue proper for the loose, we have areolar, adipose, all right, and reticular, okay. And then for the dense, you have dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, and elastic. Now, it doesn't have every single one of those, but I'll, and I'll tell you which ones, but for the most part, you're going to find dense con or connective tissue proper is going to make up significant portions of our dermis. So the skin, remember uh, when I said on Tuesday it has all four tissue types? So we went over the first tissue type, and that was the epidermis. That was epithelium, okay? So the dermis has the three remaining tissue types, all right? So that's going to include, all right, um, connective tissue, which is that areolar connective tissue, adipose connective tissue, uh, dense irregular connective tissue. Not only that, it's going to have muscle tissue in the form of the erector pili muscle, right? and then it's also going to have nervous tissue, all right, like our sensory nerve endings. Well, here you can see there's several other types of structures here. Our, our glands are made up of epithelial tissue, so we have some more epithelial tissue there. Blood vessels, sweat glands, sebaceous glands. We, we labeled all this, all right? So you're already familiar with this. So when we talk about the dermis, we break it down, okay, into the two layers. The smaller of the two, and the one that's more superficial, the papillary layer, and then we have the reticular layer, okay? So let's go into the papillary layer, all right? The primary connective tissue of the papillary layer is areolar. So it makes sense. Areolar is a loose connective tissue. And remember what I told you folks about loose connective tissue. Blood vessels love to invade loose connective tissue. So in the areolar connective tissue, you should see, all right, uh, a relatively high percentage of vascularity. I mean, there's a lot of blood vessels, okay? So in this layer, all right, your dermis has these projections, just like this. All right, and remember when we were labeling, we called those projections the dermal papillae. Okay. And what will happen is we'll see the dermal papillae with these, these ridges here, they create this interlocking, all right, sort of configuration, what we refer to as the epidermal ridges, and that's that that what forms your fingerprints. So I'm gonna come right back to the slide here. All right. That's what we're seeing here in this picture. All right. This is where you can kind of see how, all right, how you have the epidermis here with the epidermal ridges, and then they interlock with the dermal papillae here. And it creates kind of like a locking mechanism. One, and, and, and for the most part, it adds stability between these two layers. But that's what forms, all right, those fingerprint uh, ridges that we all have that's unique to ourselves. All right. So when we're talking about um, the, the dermis, the second layer is the reticular layer, and that's the deeper layer. And this is an, I've seen this asked as a test question, that the connective tissue is dense, irregular connective tissue there, okay? So you want to know you have areolar connective tissue in the papillary layer, and then you have dense irregular connective tissue in the reticular layer. It's the larger layer, the reticular layer is, and it's the deeper layer, okay? Reticular layer, you're going to find a lot of stuff just kind of hanging out there. All right, so make sure that you know that you'll get a, at least one test question, either on this test, or in chapter six on skin, or in the final, that's going to ask you connective tissue and where you're going to find it in which of these layers here. Okay? All right. So, some things that you're going to see in the dermis, all right, that are protein fiber related are going to be lots of collagen. Remember, collagen was that, that big, thick, kind of bundle like uh, protein fiber. So, that's going to add strength. All right, and resiliency to your skin, okay? So if you were to pull up on your skin, you know, 
the reason why I'm not ripping my skin off the back of my hand is because of the collagen fibers and also because of the elastic fibers, all right? Both of these in concert with one another, all right, are going to create what we call these lines of cleavage. And what they are are these parallel lines, all right, in which when the collagen and, 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 the, and the elastic fibers lay down, all right, it'll, it, it prevents wrinkles. But for a perfect example, lines of cleavage are really significant for plastic surgeons and some surgeons in general because if you make an incision that's parallel to, to a line of cleavage, and I'll show you an example, when it heals, you'll have minimal scar tissue. So like here, if you've seen the chapter, okay, you can see these are all the noted lines of cleavage here throughout the body, all right? So most of your uh, plastic surgeons and surgeons in general pretty much have a, a general understanding of these lines of cleavage. So when they're going to make a surgical incision, more so for plastic surgeons, they're going to want to make that surgical incision parallel to the lines of cleavage instead of perpendicular. Because when they heal, right, those elastic fibers and the collagen fibers will close the wound much more effectively and, and you'll have a less scarring. Okay? So that's something in case anybody here is interested in going into plastic surgery. It's uh, something that you should know, all right? And again, when you're trying to get wounds to heal, obviously you want to speed the healing rate. One, what's a big reason why you want something to heal quickly? Right, right. You, you want to prevent infection, all right? So the quicker you can do it, and these lines of cleavage will help with that, it reduces the opportunistic in, uh, organisms or, or, or the uh, pathogens to cause infections within us, okay? So in some cases, and um, you see this here in, in folks, um, weightlifters especially, all right, when, when they're exercising and their muscle mass grows at, at an accelerated rate and their skin can't keep up with it, they get these lines which are called striae, okay? And they're stretch marks. All right, and it's because the collagen was stretched beyond its capacity. It couldn't, it didn't, your body was not given enough time to compensate for the increased mass, specifically the muscle mass and time. So it stretched the, the, the collagen out and it creates these striate marks, these stretch marks that you'll see. All right, the last layer, the subcutaneous layer. All right, and when I say it's the last layer, it's the last layer of, uh, uh, um, when we're discussing um, the uh, skin, but it's not part of the skin. So again, make sure that you make a note of this, that it is not part of the integument. Do not be confused by that. Okay? I'm going to go to big X. Sorry, subcutaneous layer or hypodermis. You're not part of the integument. Okay? It's primarily made up of the two A's. All right? And that's the loose connective tissue, both areolar, all right, and adipose, right? And because there's a, quite a bit of adipose in that layer, right, you already know the functions of fat, all right, insulation, cushioning, energy storage, all right? So in addition to that, all right, we add protection, okay? So the subcutaneous there, it's nice to have all that adipose tissue close by, all right, especially because there's a high level of vascularity in that area. So and when you have a high level of vascularity, think of your blood vessels as like a transportation system in your body. If you've ever been to New York or Chicago, the um, subway, okay? It allows the New York State subway, New York State, the New York City subway allows people to get to a lot of places well, your blood vessels allow for a lot of elements that are in your blood to move to a lot of places in your body. And it's nice to have that adipose tissue nearby if you, if you need to have a, a quick burst of energy for if you're running a marathon or any type of cellular uh, aerobic respiration, it's nice to have that close by. And that's one of the reasons why it's a great injection area. 
because when you have a lot of blood vessels in that area, whatever drug that you're administering can travel throughout your circulatory system. Okay? All right. So let's talk about some of the functions of the skin here. We've already talked about the components, so we've kind of done the anatomy portion. Let's talk about the physiology. All right. So a lot of things that that we know about the skin, you know, we don't really quite realize the importance of some of the functions that our skin actually provides for us. And so we kind of lump it in under protection. I mean, obviously, it prevents our body from injury here, all right? But at the same time, it prevents the invasion of microbes into your, your body in general. It's a protective barrier. It's one of the membranes of your body, okay? And the cutaneous membrane is the largest one. So not only that, but it does protect you from hot and cold temperatures through thermal regulation. We talked about that in chapter one. It happens when you're in a hot environment, right? When you get vasodilation and vasoconstriction when you're in a cold environment. Another purpose of the cutaneous membrane is to help to protect us from the ultraviolet radiation that you receive from the sun. All right, we saw that with the melanocytes and their production of melanin. One of the, what is the biggest concern um, that doctors have, or medical personnel, I should say, have for uh, burn victims? There's two, two big ones. Dehydration is one of them, yeah. An infection, okay? So your skin prevents your body, all right, from dehydration. Like I said before, right, it's water resistant but not waterproof. So it helps to hold in a lot of the moisture that our body contains, all right? And it loses some, like I said, you know, through sweat, through that process of transpiration, which is just in your sweat glands, just let off some moisture uh, every once in a while, okay? So it helps us to retain that water. Our, our body loves cool water. We need water for a lot of things, all right? But it loves to recycle, and it's stingy, all right? It's frugal. It wants to hold on to things. We get to talk about this awesome vitamin, vitamin D3. Would that be T2? I don't know. Tool, what is that? Does anyone know? What do you, what do you mean by that? Tool? T-E-W-L. Stacy, I am not familiar with that term. Does that stand for something? Oh, <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. All right. Yes, that would. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, that would be it. So vitamin D, we'll talk a little bit about it, all right? The importance of it, and for this class, I mean, we're not going to get into the um, immune functions of vitamin D, but we will talk about uh, its role in calcium uh, metabolism, all right? Or, excuse me, calcium regulation, okay? So vitamin D is synthesized in your skin, and then it has to go to two organs to become activated, all right? And we'll go through the steps uh, in Chapter 6 here. Uh, as to what how that occurs, all right? But the active form of vitamin D is called calcitriol. And its job is to regulate calcium loss. And what that means is usually when you have low blood calcium levels, calcitriol will prevent your kidneys from excreting calcium, okay? So keep that in mind. And again, with cal two components of your bone are calcium and phosphate. And we'll talk about that in Chapter 7 when we talk about hydroxyapatite, which are your bone salts, okay? But what calcitriol does, mainly for calcium regulation, all right? But think of calcium. What do you think of calcium? What do we use calcium for in our body? Everything. That's true, everything. Strong teeth and bones, all right? Yep, and that's, that's the first thing that everybody thinks of with calcium. But you also need it for proper muscle contractions. You need it for proper neurological uh, or, or nervous system functioning for the transmission of nerve signals. And you also need it for blood clotting. Okay, so you need it for several crucial things. And without calcium, if you had no calcium in your body, you wouldn't be able to contract your muscles and you wouldn't be able to send nerve signals. So essentially, you'd be dead. Okay, so it's important. We need to, to hold on to that. What about phosphate? What do you use phosphate for? Energy, exactly. ATP. Remember, then it's the triphosphate. So when you see phosphate, 
if you want to think of energy, but also it's incorporated into our bones for that hydroxy appetite. And your bones are a great storage site for both calcium and phosphate. So if energy levels start to get low and we need some ingredients to make some ATP, go to the bones, all right? If your calcium levels start to get low, all right, we're going to go to the bones because they're storing calcium, but also we're going to tell our kidneys, hey, kidneys, don't excrete any calcium in the urine. Hold on to it. Resorb as much as you can so we can increase our blood calcium levels, okay? So that's what vitamin D does. It helps to prevent, all right, the loss of calcium and phosphate, all right? All right. Secretion and absorption, all right? So, again, when we are going to sweat when we're working out, all right, some of us have a pleasant odor, uh, odor and some of us have a less pleasant odor, right? Part of that, all right, is from the wastes that get excreted into the sweat, mainly urea, which is a dilated version of your urine, okay? Uh, your urine has a decent compo uh, nitrogen component to it, and so does urea, all right? So that will occur during sweating. If anyone here knows somebody that tried to quit smoking, and they put the nicotine patch on themselves, well, think about it, okay? Your skin is the largest organ in your body. It's a great site for absorption. Um, if you've ever had to have my dog, or my old dog, before my dad stole him from me, um, he had back surgery. He was, his last two lumbar vertebrae in his back was hit by a car, and he shattered his two lumbar vertebrae, and he was paralyzed. So we had surgery for him, and they put eight rods into his back, and then back. And um, they put a fentanyl patch on him. It was transdermal. So they just stuck it on him, and it was, his skin was able to absorb the fentanyl into his bloodstream, thus decrease his pain um, with the opioids there. So we see that all the time with transdermal administration for some of the drugs there. It's great, all right? Immune function in the skin, remember those uh, Langerhans cells or the, the uh, dendritic cells? We talked about those that hang out in the epidermis, the stratum spinosum there, okay? A lot of the times they're going to intercept abnormal cell formation due to, say, ultraviolet radiation, uh, mutation or, uh, of, of some of the keratinocytes. So the, it, those cells will initiate an immune response in that situation, okay? Temperature regulation, remember back in chapter one, when we talked about when you're ice fishing and when that guy was chopping wood, all right? You saw what happened with the skin there. You would, you would sweat to release heat. You would have vasodilation of the blood vessels in your skin. That would increase blood flow to that area because your blood is one degree warmer than your normal body temperature. So that would give off heat and then when you were in a cold environment, you get vasoconstriction that would decrease blood flow to your skin, keeping your blood closer to the internal organs. So that would, uh, and then you would start to shiver. So you'll see that the skin plays a huge role in temperature regulation. And then also, all right, we'll talk more about it in chapter 16 when we talk about the special receptors, but your skin is loaded with sensory receptors. You've got vibration receptors in your skin, you've got light touch receptors in your skin deep touch receptors in your skin, all sorts of receptors, all right, especially for touch. You kind of, so you, you have that awareness of your surroundings, okay? All right. <laughs> all right. So we're going we're gonna to start talking about, um, I wasn't sure if it was in lab or lecture, um, but we're going to talk about nails, all right? The skin has a few structures that are derived from, all right, the epithelial tissue, all right? Nails are one, and then our hair is another. So we're gonna start off with the nails, and I'm debating whether to talk about the nails. I'm gonna do that in lecture, okay? Because I wanna say, yeah, well, I'm gonna wait till lecture to do that, guys. Let's stop here with that. I'm gonna finish up the rest of that stuff in the lecture. Um, yeah, 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 and then uh, let's do some labeling, and uh, we'll go from there. Just when I was getting in a roll, on a roll, I should say. Is 
anyone at home have any questions about anything that I just talked about? No. Okay. All right. So now what we're about to talk about, all right, here is not going to be on the first lab. Okay. Just keep that in mind. This is going to be on the second lab. Okay. So we're just going to do some labeling now, and then uh, on Tuesday we'll uh, we'll do some uh, PowerPoint presentations on uh, Skeleton. All right. So first of all, yes, sir. Sorry. Um. So since it's going to be chapter six, will the nail and the hair still be on the lab test? That's a great question. Uh, most is a, there's a possibility that some of that might because uh, that's also in lecture. Um, that's a great question. I, I don't think so. All right, okay, make it sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the, I'm almost positive it won't be for this one here. If you were on my online class, there it would be, but it should it won't be. Watch every okay. question be Pardon? So watch every question be there. No, I mean to be honest with you. Uh, the questions that uh, that would appear there would be the stuff that we've already discussed. Um, nails and hair. I don't even think you have any uh, test questions for that. Why not? That's usually lecture stuff. So let's talk about the skeleton. All right. Two parts to our skeleton. We have an appendicular skeleton and an axial skeleton. So we're going to start off discussing the axial skeleton. So you need to know what makes up the axial skeleton. And that's going to be the midline portion of your body. So what does that include? Your skull, your vertebral column, right, and your thoracic cage, your ribs and sternum. Okay, that's going to be all right. The axial skeleton. Okay, so keep that in mind. So it's and again, it's along the body's central axis here. Okay, so skull, vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, right, which includes the ribs and the sternum. All right, but what you should know is, all right, well, before I get to that point, a couple of the functions of the skeleton. One is, to, is for protection, right? What do your ribs protect? Your lungs. Your, yeah, your organs, lungs, heart, okay, and, and any of the structures that are in your chest, all right? So that's one of the functions of the skeleton. Another one is a storage site for what I was talking to you guys about before with calcium and phosphorus and whatnot, okay? And it's a site that where, where hemopoiesis occurs, and that's the creation of the blood elements, white blood cells, uh, pro, uh, platelets, and red blood cells. Okay, so keep in mind that the axial skeletal skeleton, all right, not only is its per, one of its purposes is to protect the organs, it's essentially the central framework that the rest of your skeleton attaches to. Your appendicular skeleton is just your arms and your legs. So the appendicular skeleton attaches onto your, your axial skeleton here. So it's that framework, all right, that's going to support the rest of you. So a big, and a big part of the axial skeleton is this process here, hematopoiesis. Okay? So when we talk about hematopoietic tissue, we're talking about the tissue that's going to make your red and white blood cells and your platelets. And that occurs mainly in the adult in the axial skeleton. So your vertebra, all right, your skull, all right, sternum's a big place for a lot of production. Now, when you're young, all right, like a baby, your whole skeleton is making all these tissues. But as you start to age and get older, all right, it starts to transition more to the axial skeleton. Here. So I'll show you a picture here. That's your axial skeleton. All right, you got your skull. All right, here's your vertebral column, okay, and then your thoracic cage, which includes includes your ribs and your sternum. All right, so these areas are highly hematopoietic, so that's where you're making those blood cells there. Okay, a couple things, a couple views of the skull, and I just want to review this with you because you're going to need to know that. This view here is, is the inferior view. This is just we're looking up through the bottom portion of your skull. All right, this is the anterior or frontal view. This is a lateral view. This is the back of your head, so this is the posterior view. This is the top, so that is going to be the superior view. And this is a mid-sagittal view. Okay, so I'll 
take you through all these, and I'll try to remember to tell you which view we're looking at on each slide. Okay? So what you're seeing now is that we've just taken the top of the skull off, all right? And so we can see this area here, and I'll go over it more uh, next class. All right, this is the cranium. All right, and the top part here is called the calvarium. All right, let's do some labeling. Okay, um, anyone have a page number that they want to throw? 15. 15, okay, 15. Those of you at home. All right, so the frontal bone is your forehead. Not just your forehead, but it's all here, the top portion of your orbits here, all right, but that's your frontal bone. So just make sure, and I can't stress this enough, when you're taking the test, the lab test, if it asks you the name of the bone, all right, make sure that you're writing the name of the bone because the arrow could be pointing to a specific structure on that bone. And, that, and that's what a lot of students do. They'll look right at the arrow and they see what it's looking at. And then up at the top here, it has what bone is this? And it could be pointing uh, at the eyebrow, all right, which is the superciliary arch. And so they'll write superciliary arch. And then it's asking for the bone. It's wrong. Okay. So please, if there's any words on the slide, Read them first, all right, before you write down your answer. All right, so the frontal squama, squama means flat, you already know, because the squamous cell is flat, all right? This is going to be that flat portion of your forehead here. All right, so this slide and the previous slide are virtually the same, all right? So if it were to just have an arrow pointing to this area here, you would write frontal squama, all right? But if it says, what well, bone is this, then you would write the frontal bone, okay? All right, here you can see on this other model here. You might have to flip back and forth on a few pages here. You won't have all of these slides in your book, okay? Because I've got some slides up here that have our, our skulls. We have some, some uh, skulls that have uh, their the bones are different colors. Okay, you don't have those slides in your book. All right, so where your eyebrows kind of sit, there's a ridge right above each of your eye sockets. And by the way, your eye sockets are called the orbits. Okay, so therefore, if we're above the orbit, we're superior to it. So this is the supra orbital margin. Okay, supraorbital, oh, I it's talking like supraorbital margin. All right, and here you can see it on this slide here. All right, it's just, this is the orbit right here. Okay, and just above it, that ridge line there, that's the supraorbital Golly, supraorbital margin. All right. So if you look at this slide here, you notice on, on, on this slide, there's this little kind of like nick, all right, in the supraorbital margin. And we refer to that as a notch. So the same name applies. It's above the orbit, so it's the supraorbital notch. Not to be confused with another structure that could be in the same area. And it's like a hole in the bone, a rounded hole. Anytime you see a rounded hole in a bone, that's called a foramen. Okay, we'll go over it more next, uh, next class. I'll, I'll show you a chart. It has some of the names. But just keep in mind for right now, if you see a hole, a rounded hole in a bone, we refer to that as a foramen. And a foramen is just a hole in a bone where things can pass through. It could be blood vessels, it could be nerves, all right? It, it can be a couple different things. So this is a, is a, it's an incomplete hole, okay? So that's, therefore, that's a notch. So I'm going to show you another slide here. Not to be, so here you can see, Here's your supraorbital notch here, 
in here. It's not a complete whole, but this over here, right? That's a foramen. See how it's a complete whole? Okay. And this one's not. I'll show you on this slide here. That is the supraorbital foramen. Please don't get that confused. Okay, on a test. So you want to make sure if we're around the eye, all right, if it's a complete hole like that, that's foramen, all right. But if it looks like there's a nick, you know, out of the bone, that's a notch. I don't want you to lose points on that. Okay. Parietal bone. I don't know what page that's on. What page is that on? Okay. That's pretty tough to identify. Okay. You just see something like that. That's tough to identify. So that's a pure memorization one. Personally, when I make my lab, lab tests, we're gonna we, we're using department lab tests for honor lock. But when I make my lab tests, I don't really use this. All right. I like to show the parietal bone this way, like this. That's way better, right? Because you have it gives you reference. You can see where it is in relation to the other bones. This way here, what the heck am I looking at? You know, that's a tough one. Okay, but this again, it's just a memorization thing. That's the parietal bone. Here you can see it. And unfortunately, you don't have this in your um, <clears throat> lab manual. Okay, but you can see in relation up here. This is the frontal bone up here. This tannish bone. Okay, so the parietal bone sits just behind it on the top side and kind of the upper portion of the back of the head there. Okay. Here you can see it. You do have that in your book, I believe. Okay. So that's the parietal bone. So to kind of outline it for you. There you go. Not my best, but that's the parietal bone. All right. On the back side of the skull, okay, that's the occipital bone. I'll show you on the model that you folks have. All right, that's a posterior view of the skull. So it's kind of cut off here, but no. So pretty much all that. That's the occipital bone. And then you can see, and I this this over here is the parietal bone, and this over here is the other parietal bone. So, it's really tough to see, but kind of like that. That's the actual bone. All right. So, this is the occipital bone all by itself. Okay. One of my favorite structures. Okay, is the frame of magnum. All right. Magnum means really, really, really big. Okay. So what this is saying is this is a big hole. And what come what we have to say, right or left bridal bone? Uh yes. Yes, you will. You'll have to say left or right. Now, if I just throw the bone up there all by itself, like that one, and no, you don't have to. All right. But when you see it. Uh, on a full skull, yes, you would have to say left or right to right bone. You got it. Okay. So uh, a very important structure passes through the foramen magnum. That's your spinal cord. Okay. That's how it escapes out of your skull is through that structure. So this is an in inferior view, okay, of the skull. So you can see the here's the foramen magnum. And then on either side of the foramen magnum, you have what's known as the occipital condyle. Condyle is a rounded, smooth projection or process that comes off of a bone. So if I was looking at these condyles from the side, they would look like this. Okay, so they're rounded and they're smooth. All right, so you have two of them, 
one on each side, and they sit on either side of the frame and magnum. Take this opportunity to get acquainted, right, where some structures are in relation to other structures. It'll help you to figure out and get your bearings and find out where you're at. Okay, so here are the, the uh, occipital condyles on this uh, model here. Now the occipital condyles articulate, that means connect, they connect with the first bone in your neck, the first vertebrae, and okay? that vertebrae is called the atlas. So those condyles kind of sit down inside the atlas. The atlas is like a cup. <clears throat> All right, occipital condyles. All right, going back to the posterior view here of our skull on the back here, there's a little kind of bump here, structure right here. And so if you reach around and touch the back of your head, you'll feel a little knob there, okay? And the larger that knob is, the smarter you are. I don't know if that's true. That was an old wives' tale, okay? That's what I was told, though, All right? But, so, occipital is describing to you where which bone it's located on. The protuberance is telling you what it is. It's protruding. It's a protuberance. So it's a little projection off the bone. And then the external is telling you if it's inside or outside of the skull. Because believe it or not, you also have an internal occipital protuberance. You don't need to know it for this class, but it's on the inside of the skull. Do you know why some people have that? Uh, yeah, partially. Um, some people have a larger one because protuberances and processes um, are sites for tendon attachments, muscle attachments. All right, and you have a ligament, it's called the ligamentum nuque, and it attaches, did you, did you want to hold that? Yeah, feel free, you can that. Um, it attaches onto this portion of your occipital bone here. And depending on people's activities when they were younger, if it tugs, all right, if those tissues tug on that area there, it can stimulate bone growth, all right, and we'll learn that, that uh, principle when we do chapter seven, um, it, um, when a bone is getting stressed, it lays down more bone, okay? And so uh, certain peoples can get bigger. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Osgood Slaughter's disease, but it's when you get, you know, that bump that you have right in the front of your knee. Some people with Osgood Slaughter's disease have a, have a really big one, and it's because your quadriceps tendon attaches onto that area, and it keeps pulling on it, and every time it pulls on it, more bone grows. So it's almost like pulling it away. So it's a similar type. It's a, it's a, I'm sorry, Zach, that was a long explanation, um, but that's why it is. <laughs> All right, so I know, again, I know you guys don't have this. Um, here, this temporal bone, think of where your ear is, because here's your, your ear canal right here. All right, so the temporal bone sits just underneath your ear. Okay, so that's what you're gonna see. Here it is on yours. I'll kind of outline it here a little bit for you. Okay, that's the temporal bone. Now here's the temporal bone all by itself. And like the frontal bone, there's a flat portion to the temporal bone also. And so we refer to that as the squamous part of the temporal bone. Okay, so you're already familiar with the definition of squamous. A squamous cell is a flattened cell. So the squamous portion of the bone is a flattened portion of the bone. Now, technically, you should be able to tell me if this is the left temporal bone or the right temporal bone. Not right now, but just to let you know, this structure here, this process here of the temporal bone, that always faces anteriorly, okay? In this portion here, this is called the mastoid process. We'll talk about that. That's always on the posterior or the back end of the bone. So which temporal bone is this, the left or the right? That's right. Correct, I mean, that's correct. <laughs> they want to say right and confuse right. people, but yes, you are correct. That's the left, okay? So this is the left because remember this, like I said, this is facing forward, okay? All right, so now we've flipped the temporal bone over. Now we're looking at the inside of it, okay? 
So this whole region here, right, that's the petrous portion, or excuse me, it's the petrous part. You can say portion if you want, but it's the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now, if we see that on a test, can we just write Petrus part and we have to write Petrus part of it? I'll accept it. Yeah, if you write Petrus part or Petrus portion. So, after we take our hand and you go in, I'll have to, but it's going to take me a couple days. So, that's why I always tell folks usually, for the most part, when you get your exam, that pretty much would be your grade. Okay? For the lab, I have to go in and, and, and go through everything. Okay. All right. Again, this is the inside of the, of the um, temporal bone. Now, this is a superior view here. All right. This is we're looking down at the cranium. Okay. And so you can see here is the petrous portion or petrous part. Here, here's the other one. Okay. And again, you don't need to know this, but in case you were wondering, this is the internal occipital protuberance right there. All right. Back to the external view, all right? This opening here, right, where the arrow is pointing to, that is the external auditory meatus. And your ear would just kind of sit around that. Kind of like that. So a very good drawing for the ear, but that's what you're looking at. Okay? So that opening there is the external auditory meatus. Okay, just posterior or behind the external auditory meatus is the mastoid process. So this kind of bump right here. You have a bunch of air cells in that area. They're called the mastoid air cells. They're just spaces, like a sinus is a space in your skull. Well, these are tiny, tiny spaces in the mastoid process. And they can get infect, infected. I don't know if, any, if anyone's ever had mastoiditis. It's just when an infection gets back there and you press. If you press right behind your ear, you'll feel that mastoid process. And if it's tender, you know, when it's significantly tender, there's a good chance that you could have, depending on how much it hurts, a mild to moderate uh, mastoiditis going on. Okay? But bacteria love to hide in that area there. All right. So you'll see now this structure, which is inferior or below, all right, the external uh, uh, auditory meatus, all right, it looks almost like a pen, hence that's why we call it a styloid process. And that's the site for muscular attachment. All right, styloid process. And then anterior to the external auditory meatus, you'll see this kind of little depression, right? And that's the mandibular fossa. That's where your jaw attaches onto your skull. Has anyone ever heard of TMJ? No. TMJ is actually, it's actually the name of the joint. It stands for temporal mandibular joints, but we've just associated it with a condition. And anyways, TMJ is when you get that clicking or painful popping in that area, all right? Um, I used to have it really bad, and then I got punched in the jaw, and it, it went away. So <laughs> that's no joke. I mean, really, uh, when I used to wrestle in high school and mess my jaw up, and then I was at a party, and someone punched me, and then uh, it wasn't my fault. So I was in wrong place at the wrong time. But anyways, that's the joint there, the TMJ joint. All right, now you can see it in a little bit better light here, okay? There is the TMJ joint, okay? And you can see 
All right, this part, we'll talk about the name of uh, the parts of the jaw here later on. Not tonight, uh, I don't think. Um, but you can see how it articulates there with the temporal bone. So a fossa is like a depression inside of a bone, okay? Foramen is a hole in a bone. All right, fossa is a depression in the bone, okay? You want to know these little terms. And, I'll, and again, I'll go into them a little bit more uh, in the lab, in, uh, next class. All right. Now you can see that in this model here, too. Okay. Mandibular fossa. Okay. So, even more anterior to the external auditory meatus, you've got this long, bony projection. And so, like I said, when you see a bone or a part of a bone projecting off of the bone, it's called a process. So this is, and you have to write this out, folks. This is called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. You have to write all that out. It's a pain in the rear, but what it of the temporal bone. Okay. So we haven't learned all the bones of the skull yet. Okay. But in this scenario, the zygomatic process. All right, is describing the bone to which the, this part of the temp, excuse me, th that this part of the temporal bone is attaching to. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So just know that the temporal bone is going to articulate with the zygomatic bone. So we named the process after the bone that the temporal bone is articulating with, or touching. All right. It'll make a little more sense when we get to that here. Okay. So this whole structure here, that's the zygomatic process. I'll outline it. Okay. And then the zygomatic bone is this bone right here. It makes up a decent portion of your cheek. So I'll kind of outline it. Almost looks like a jigsaw puzzle piece. Okay? That's your zygomatic bone where I'm putting this X. So we named the zygomatic process after the bone that it articulates with. But at the end of this name, we name that structure for the bone that it comes from. So what I mean by that is, okay, the first part of the name for the structure is zygomatic. So that is the bone to which it articulates or connects to. Okay, so we call it the zygomatic process. The last or second part of the name is temporal bone. And that's to remind us that this process is coming off of the temporal bone. Okay, because on the other end of this, and we'll, we'll, we'll see it here in a short period of time. This portion of the zygomatic bone is called the temporal process. So we call it the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Okay, because it's telling us what bone it's articulating with. It's articulating with the temporal bone. That's the first of its name. And then the second part of its name is telling us the bone that it comes from, which is the zygomatic bone. Okay, we'll, we'll hit it here in a second. All right, this is what I tell folks. When you see a circle like this on the side of the skull, you don't even have to read the question. You should automatically know that it's the zygomatic arch. The zygomatic arch describes both processes, all right? The temporal process, which I'm putting number one here, and then where I'm putting number two, that's the temporal process, okay? So the zygomatic arch is made up of the two processes that are contributing to this structure. One is from the temporal bone, and the other one is from the zygomatic bone. So when you see that circle there, or that oval, that is the zygomatic arch. So this is on the lateral view. And when I come up on an inferior view here, I'll show you what it looks like. Oh, here it is. Perfect. All right. 
Here is the zygomatic arch on the inferior view, right here. That's the zygomatic arch there. Here's the other zygomatic arch, okay? So you need to be able to identify these structures from different angles. All right, so going to the inferior view, you guys remember what this structure that I'm putting the X in? Do you remember what that's called? Yep, frame and magnum, the big hole. And then what am I circling here? What is this structure? Drag, giddy up. Okay, so the occipital condyle. Now, when we move further lateral, further out to the side, you'll see this big hole here on this side. And you'll see another one on this side. Those are what we call the jugular foramen, named after what? Jugular vein. Okay, the jugular vein, all right, exits out of that foramen. Okay. All right, so keep in mind that the jugular foramen is going to be lateral to the occipital condyle. All right, so now we're moving anterior. We're moving just forward. Here's the jugular foramen. And then now we move just anterior to that, and we find these two smaller holes on either side. All right, and we call those the carotid canals, named after specifically the internal carotid artery. Okay? Carotid artery actually splits in your neck and it forms the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. The carotid arteries, you have two, you have a left and a right one, they actually supply your brain with 80% of its blood. It's a lot, right? So each one supplies the brain with 40%. The other 20% comes from what's called the vertebral artery. And the vertebral artery runs on either side of your neck, okay? You'll learn more about that in the circulatory system in two levels. Okay, but just keep in mind, carotid canal, the internal carotid artery travels through there. All right, jugular foramen, jugular vein. All right, just another um, repeat slide here. All right, there's the zygomatic process. Get that. Zygomatic arch. All right, now we're back on the uh, cranial view here, okay? So, all right, you're probably like, well, what's the senoid bone? What's all that all about? I'll outline it here for you. Oops, I went out too far. But anyways, kind of looks like that. It's not the best, okay? It's actually a horrible outline. All right? But just know that the senoid bone is in this general area right here, okay? I got better slides, don't worry. They do get better. All right, here's the individual sphenoid bone, okay? This is the one that's it's all, I don't know, to me it looks like a butterfly, I guess, or a bat. I've heard some people describe it as a bat, okay? So we're going to go over some of the structures here of the sphenoid bone. So this portion down here, all right, that's the greater wing. You need to say the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Okay. Greater wing, greater wing. Yes, sir. Question: Do you get to say greater wing of the sphenoid bone if we're labeling it the whole thing? Yes. Okay, I'm sure. Yep, yep. And now we'll see it on this model. I don't think you guys have that model in your book, so don't worry about it. Well, when I say don't worry about it, you can see it on a test, but don't worry about labeling it. Yeah. All right. Here's the greater wing right down here. Here and over here. All right. The lesser wing is above the greater wing. All right. 
So kind of like that. Lesser wings of the group of the sphenoid bone. And I'll show you here. So it's a little bit easier to see. Right, those are the lesser wings. And then you can see them here on this model. Okay. Lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. All right, tough to see on this one, but these are your optic canals, your optic nerve travels just below the lesser wing. All right, and you can kind of see it on your models here. Again, this is not the best, but one optic canal, another optic canal. All right, your optic nerve, that's the nerve that travels to your eye. So any nerve signals that you, anything, well, you're using them right now, all right? When, when you're looking up there at the screen, all that visual information is traveling on the optic nerve that travels through that canal, okay? All right, this is an anterior view, and you've got these kind of slits here. Not like Schlitz, that's a beer. All right, this is a slit, okay? And that's the superior orbital fissure, okay? So a fissure is like a crack, all right? Remember, foramens are rounded, all right? No, you don't have to say this, you, know, you can say superior orbital fissure, okay? So a fissure is kind of like an elongated crack. So this one right here, that would be a foramen, all right? That's a foramen. You just don't need to know that. All right, in the center of the, of the sphenoid bone, you do have to say the body of the sphenoid bone now, okay? Because you also have a body of, of, of vertebra, of vertebrae, excuse me. Okay, this is a mid sagittal cut. I'm not. Do you guys have that? Do you have that view in your? I don't think you do. All right. Okay. So this structure is it's something that it's part of the sphenoid bone. It's called the sella tersica. Stands for Turkish saddle. Okay. It's important that you know that it kind of looks like like this. All right, so if we're looking at the sphenoid from the side, all right, and there's a gland that sits right there, and that's called the pituitary gland. Okay, you guys may have heard of that, the pituitary gland. It has to do a lot with endocrine function, certain hormones, all right. Well, anyways, it sits right there in that cella tersica. Okay, so I'll actually zoom in on it. I know you don't have this in your book, but just commit it to memory. Okay, the resolution is not the best on this. Okay, but it's just the area right here. All this is the sphenoid bone right here. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's literally like a saddle. Yep, yep. Right. Yes, sir. So then I read about like the, the uh, I can't even point out. A little hole right there. What was that about? What was that right there? Oh, you're talking about the the uh, external uh, auditory meatus. You're pointing to your ear, so that's what I was thinking. Well, we're going glass. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry, yeah. It's the like right, I guess. Oh, I see what you're right. saying. That was. Yeah. Um, the best way. Yeah, you can't really see it here. All right, but the external auditory meatus. I wouldn't use it as a, 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 as a, a reference point. What I what I would use is on this next slide here. I know you don't have this picture, but where those occipital canal, uh, the the optic canal. Excuse me. Where, let me go back. Let me show you a better one. Right here. This is where the cella tersica is. Okay. Right here. Again, you're looking down on it. All right. But if we were to look at it from the side, it would have that kind of cutaway appearance here. 
But generally, that's where it's that's where it is. Pretty much, we have we have a little reference for it. Yep. So you can see it a little bit better here. Right? If you wanted to shade all this area in, that's your cella turcica. Oh, I think we've seen enough of the cell terms again. Oh my gosh, it doesn't stop. <laughs> All right, and these should be the last. This whole structure, right? Yeah. These are called the pterygoid processes. Both of these. Here and here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Poor Steam went wrong. No, we really have nine more slides. That's it. No, not for this. Not for the bone. <laughs> no, no. Let me put this evening. <clears throat> okay. Um, um. On. Let me go back one slide. I'll come right back to this real quick. All right. You're going to see the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. Okay. That those are these structures right here. Here. Here, here, All right? I just wanted to show you here because the view on this one is not that great. Zoom in a little bit here. All right, here's the lateral one. All right, the lateral pterygoid plate. And then here, that's going to be, I'm going to zoom out. That's the medial pterygoid plate. And when they're together, like you see in this circle here, all right, that's the pterygoid process. Okay. And basically, what you have these two muscles that will attach onto these plates. The lateral pterygoid plate, that muscle allows you to shift your jaw to the side. Okay. Well, they both. Let me just let me rephrase that. The medial and lateral pterygoid muscles allow you to move your jaw from side to side. What's this hole right here? Where? Where the, my little fingers pointing to. Oh, right? uh, the jug, um, yeah, I heard it. Jugular. Jugular or what? Foramen. Foramen. Yep. What's this hole right here? Right. No. Yep. Good, good, good. And what's this structure here? That's the, um, the, the, the arch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, not the process. The arch. The zygomatic arch. It's getting, it has both processes. As the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and then the temporal process from the zygomatic bone. All righty, look at that. That's funky. All right, that's the ethmoid bone. This is the bone that sits at the top of your nose. When I say the top of your nose, I should rephrase that the top of your nasal cavity. Okay, way up there. This is a lateral view of it, by the way. Okay, so we're looking at it from the side. When you see it from the front, it might scare you and give you nightmares. Okay, because it's a funky looking bone. All right, so that's the ethmoid bone. All right, and where it sits, it sit, it's like an island. It sits in an island of the frontal bone. So I'm going to outline this is just part of the ethmoid bone. That's it. On either side, over here or over here, that's all frontal bone. Okay, so the ethmoid bone just sits right in there. So you see this, this thing right here, what I'm putting the little finger thing on, okay, where I'm going to put this little blue line, that little thing there, that's this thing. Okay, it's called the Christigalli. I'll show it to you here in a second. All right. So look at that. That's a, this is, now what we've done is we've cut the ethmoid bone out. You cut it away 
from the frontal bone. This is a superior view. We're looking down. I know it's a little scary. We're still we're looking down at this. I'm gonna go back to this bone here. So if we were to zoom in on here, all right? This isn't the best model for it, but if we're to zoom in on it, okay. All right, so this is pretty much the ethmoid bone here. So that on this next slide, we've cut everything away from it. Okay, we've cut everything away because underneath all, right, all this, we see that the ethmoid bone sits. And, we, and so we're seeing, you can't see it very well on this slide, but there's all these holes here. So when we cut it away, you get this. So this outline, this black outline, that's what you, well, I shouldn't say, that is, that's the cribriform plate. These are all these holes here. And you have nerves that travel through. And this right here is that crystal that little shark thing. Yes, sir. Uh, we, yeah, we could be the inferior part of the patient, but the superior one. So let's go. Right, right, right. I'm just, this, this is just showing you. Okay, you don't have that view in your book. This is just kind of zooming in and showing you what I just showed you on the previous page. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what this is. This is still a superior view where you're looking down, all right? But now we just cut everything away. And we're showing you the ethmoid bone that's underneath, right? So you can only see a small part of it. You can see this part, the crystal and then you have this is called the cribriform plate, all right? That shows the olfactory foramina. So the cribriform plate has all these holes in it, and you have your smelling nerves, your olfactory nerves go into those holes into your nose. So you should have lots. Well, I think I have. I know I have it on this one. So what this is pointing to is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. You have to write that whole thing out. Have you ever heard of a, of a deviated septum? Probably. You have one. Okay. So there's two parts to your septum. The septum is just something that divides your nasal cavity into the left part of the nasal cavity and the right part. But it ha it's made up of both bone and cartilage. So obviously there's no cartilage here because it's all gone. So the, the bony nasal septum, and you'll hear me say this all the time, is made up of two bones, or, or two structures. It's made up of this, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, all right, which is pretty much all this above this line. Okay? This right here that I'm filling in, that is not part of the ethmoid bone. That's a different bone. It's called the bomer, all right? And I'll show you that in a second. Okay? So the, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the bomer make up your bony nasal septum, okay? So this is the view that you have in your book, okay? I told you, it's a freaky looking bone here. All right, so this is the longest projection off of, all right, your ethmoid bone, it's right in the middle, that's the perpendicular plate. Oh, you don't have that one? Oh, I thought you guys did. Hold on. You have that one. All right, go ahead and label that. You have that one. Yes. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So this center part here, that's your perpendicular plate. And you don't have that one, you said, correct? Yeah. yeah. All right. So this, again, this is when we cut away the frontal bone and just pulled out the ethmoid bone. Here's the crystagala. That's what you're looking down on. Okay, so if I go back to, all right, we're just looking at this now, all right, we're looking down on it, okay, in the next slide here. So this is the crystagala here. So on either side, in this region here, you see all those holes there, okay? Those are those tiny holes. That's called the cribriform. Well, we call the whole structure the cribriform plate, but you can also call it, well, not the same structure, you can also call those holes cribriform foramina or olfactory foramina. That's where the, the nerves 
for your sense of smell, they travel through those holes into your nasal cavity. All right, last one. Oh, you don't have this one anyways. But what this is showing you here is your bony nasal septum, okay? And you have two parts to it. You've got the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. And then on another slideshow, I'll show you this bone here. It's called the boma. And to me, it looks like a bent arrowhead, okay? And that makes up the inferior portion of it. All right. Um, are there any questions about anything? Okay. If there are, ask me, email me, whatever you like to do. Um, please make sure you sign the lab. And who would like to stay after with me tonight? Thank you, sir. Perfect. Okay. Um, any questions at home for you guys? It's just no, no, just right across from where you signed before. Yep. I know. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, and it's normal to feel overwhelmed. But definitely take the time over this weekend to go over some of this material, read over some of those, or not read over it, but watch some of the videos in case you need a little bit of help. I would focus a lot on lab this weekend since your lab test is Monday. Okay?